Tonight, Afghans return home after 20 years of war, says Taliban government. And Israel's stark warning that it would erode every inch of Hezbollah and Lebanon. Later in the show, from the vaults, an imam's effort to end domestic violence. It's important to, to be able to um, address the perpetrators in, in the sense of, from, from the perspective of wanting to provide support. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. This is Muslim News Canada on Muslim Network TV. I'm Catherine Bullock. The Afghan Ministry of Refugee and Repatriation says more than 900,000 Afghan refugees have returned home over the last year from neighbouring countries. The ministry says Afghan refugees returned to Afghanistan from Iran, Pakistan and other countries. The ministry released the figures at a press conference. Data from the UN shows more than 8 million Afghans have been driven out of their country by violence, conflict and poverty. A vast majority of Afghan refugees have been living in neighbouring Pakistan and Iran ever since the US launched its war on the country in early 2001. Israel's Defence Minister, Yoav Gallant, has issued a warning to Hezbollah, stating that if war breaks out, Israel will, quote, return Lebanon to the Stone Age. Recent clashes between Hezbollah and Israeli forces along the border prompted Gallant's statement. He emphasized that while Israel doesn't seek war, it's fully prepared to protect its citizens, soldiers, and sovereignty. Gallant directly addressed Hezbollah's, Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, warning that any escalation would have severe consequences. He warned that Israel would erode every inch of Lebanon and Hezbollah in case of conflict. Israel accuses Hezbollah of provocations, which escalated after a roadside bombing attributed to the group. Tensions have risen, leading to confrontations involving civilians, Hezbollah, and Israeli troops along the fortified border. The United Nations monitors the borders of both countries, officially still at war since 1948. A 2006 conflict between them lasted over a month. Moscow is accusing Poland and Finland of threatening its security and is vowing a response to multiplying threats on Russia's western frontier from NATO members. Poland, Ukraine's staunch ally and neighbour, has strengthened security on its border with Belarus after Belarus's capital Minsk became a new base for Russian Wagner fighters. Finland, which shares a long border with Russia, joined NATO in April in an historic move. Russian Defence Minister Sergei Shoigu says that threats to the Russian military have multiplied in the western and northwestern strategic directions. Shoigu says those risks require a timely and adequate response. He singled out Poland, which he said was being militarised and used by the United States as the main instrument of anti-Russian politics. Poland announced Wednesday it would send an additional 2,000 troops to its eastern border to join the 2,000 soldiers already stationed there. President Vladimir Putin said last month that Moscow would respond to any aggression against Belarus with all the means at its disposal. For more on how to deal with domestic violence, stay tuned. A recent report suggests that a woman is killed every six days by her intimate partner. Muslims are not immune from this. What are we doing to address this? Today we are joined by an imam who works with a social resource centre in London, Ontario, to talk about the launch of his new booklet, which is a series of Friday sermons, or khutbah, on preventing and responding to domestic violence. Welcome, Imam Abdul Fatawakil. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. 
very important work that you're undertaking. We know that in the community, we often, um, there's a dislike about even discussing this. Uh, it doesn't happen in our community. Uh, if it does, let's keep it hush hush. But in the introduction to your booklet, you say that it's a quote, perilous challenge. So can you talk a little bit about why you decided to take, to take this topic on? Absolutely. Bismillah, uh, alhamdulillah. So in terms of understanding the necessity and the critical nature of, of the subject of addressing um, domestic violence within our community. I mean, the first thing to understand is that domestic violence is not something that is limited um, to the, the Muslim community. This is a human problem. And the statistic that you quoted at the beginning uh, of the interview is indicative um, of you know, domestic violence in Canada. Uh, and so Muslims um, are, are not exempt or are not, um, you know, protected from, from this matter, um, but we need to be able to address it um, because it is something that um, is, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions surrounding it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's imperative that, that we speak about this publicly um, in order to be able to, to understand if this is something that exists in our homes, how we can change it and, and address it. Mm. Why do you think it's imperative to speak about it publicly? Why isn't that something that we do deal with hush hush and privately? Well, because this is something that, that has such a deep impact on our community. And when it comes to addressing wrong, when it comes to addressing any sort of act of uh, injustice or, or oppression, um, then, then it's imperative. When I talk about this publicly, we're not calling people out per se in and of themselves mm -hmm. to say such and such a person is doing something. No. But the idea is to bring light to it so that a person can reflect, does this apply to me? And this is how the Prophet ﷺ would address problems within the community. He wouldn't mm -hmm. confront people individually, but rather he would say, what do you say of a people who do such and such a thing? in mm -hmm. order to point it out. And, and that's the idea here is that this is uh, for the purpose of public education within our community, that it exists, it's real, it's happening, and it has a, a very strong and severe impact on the well-being of our families, on the well-being of individuals within these families, that, that must be addressed. Mm. I see that in the introduction you also talked about having sort of two hopes for this uh, booklet series that you've done. One was to, to tell the women or anyone who's experiencing abuse, because we know that there are also a small percentage of men who suffer uh, domestic violence in the home, uh, that hope that there's hope for them to get out of this situation, that they don't have to bear it uh, and live through it as some kind of test of their patience. But you also address the perpetrators what you're doing is wrong, I, I, you know, I invite you to self-reflect. I feel that your focus and your direct speech to the perpetrators is new. I've seen a lot of work uh, in the Muslim community focused on women. How can we help the women? How can we help the women know that they don't have to put up with this? How can we help them get out of it? I don't remember seeing such a direct speech to perpetrators. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that and 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 what you want us to think about? Sure. So, I mean, it, it's important to, to be able to um, address the, the perpetrators in, in the sense of from, from the perspective of wanting to provide support. Now, mm. how do we do that? Because, I mean, one of the, the primary um, hadiths um, upon which this entire series is based on is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu help your brother, whether they are oppressing or being oppressed. And the companions, they asked, they said, we know if, if they're being oppressed, you know, to help them, how we can help them. How do we help the oppressor? Hmm. This is the perpetrator. And so then the Prophet ﷺ said by stopping them from their acts of oppression. And that is you helping them. So the, the tendency, unfortunately, when it comes to addressing domestic violence is everything and all the focus is on supporting the victims but we never talk about supporting the perpetrators. And when we say that, what do we mean by supporting the perpetrators mm -hmm. is by allowing them to, to, to come to a level of consciousness and awareness that what they're doing is wrong and, and that the first person that they're wronging is not the victim, it's actually themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's something that needs to come to an end. And, and so it's from the perspective of understanding where the wrong is being uh, done or perpetrated so that a person can stop it 
out of for their sake. For it's, uh, there, there's there's ultimately a sense of of compassion and concern towards them in the sense that they have to stop, mm -hmm. right? Not in terms of the acts that they're perpetrating to say that it's okay for them to, to continue to do that. No, absolutely not. It's in fact the opposite. Mm -hmm. But it's a different perspective and viewpoint so that they don't feel that they're isolated. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as they feel that they're isolated and they want to change, well, provide them the means by which they can change. Give them that opportunity that, that they can, you know, self-reflect and be critical of themselves and of their actions so that they can change and, and improve themselves to stop the, the wrong actions that, that are taking place. Yes, that's what I was saying. It seems like a, a new angle on that. And then you, you also talk about them uh, repenting and, and, and giving them hope that they stop, they repent from the sin, and then they can start a new life. Absolutely, because our faith tradition, it's very much um, involved in, in redemption, involved in reintegration, right? Um, because even when it comes to, you know, a person when they feel a sense of guilt or remorse for what they've done, that's one of the conditions of repentance, um, that they feel a sense of guilt or remorse. Well, why is that there? It, it's so that it becomes a mechanism to, to check one's own actions that they don't re repeat them, that they don't do it again because it's, it's uncomfortable, because of that, that sense of guilt. It is not for the purpose of pushing people into an abyss of despair and depression where they can't get out of it and there's no way for them to rectify themselves, right? Now, if a person mm -hmm. doesn't see that, then it becomes a, a, another issue. It, it becomes compounded in the sense that they don't realize what they're doing is, is wrong. Right. Well, that and, was, and that, 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 that's that was a different exactly, approach. Yeah, I mean, that yeah. was exactly going to be my, my next question. It's very widespread in the community that it's not wrong for the husband to hit his wife. So why would I repent? I'm not doing anything wrong. Well, because, I yeah, I mean, but when, when we look at the example of our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mean, there are very clear traditions that talk about, you know, uh, he never hit anything, never hit his, his, a, a, a woman any of his wives, a child, a servant, or, or any object for that matter, um, that the Prophet had never hit anything with his hand. That's, he's our example, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even when it comes to, you know, this idea of, of, of striking uh, women and, and, and whatnot, it's completely misunderstood. And that's where, why we have to kind of challenge people's understanding of this, to say, no, no, this is not how, what it's meant to be. It, it's not as you think it is, in the sense that if you are causing any form of harm through violence to another person that that's what the point of the sharia is it's actually the exact opposite mm. and so the series is actually meant to put a stop and end to the various forms of domestic violence rather than to act as a form of justification for for perpetrating them and and that's what needs to be challenged within our community because of this widespread uh, misunderstanding there's mm -hmm. nothing in our faith tradition, neither in the Quran nor in the hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu that allow for any act of injustice or wrong to be perpetrated. And, and that includes the various forms of, of domestic violence. But it's something that needs to be unpacked. Mm -hmm. And without unpacking it and to be able to provide the proper context and understanding for it, even from within our own faith traditions and our texts. Right, mm -hmm. that uh, it, it it then would allow for for things to continue to be perpetrated that that are wrong, and and our faith tradition is completely against that. And you've produced this booklet. I'll just quickly show it, and it has a, It's called the Friday Sermon Series. So you have seven quick buzz. We've got about thirty seconds left. Can you just quickly tell us what the seven cover? So um, the the seven uh, different topics um, are broad, um, and they cover uh, human dignity. They also cover establishing and maintaining healthy relationships. Um, the third sermon covers understanding the various forms of domestic violence. The fourth looks at understanding the impact that domestic violence has on households. The fifth talks about myths versus facts when it comes to domestic violence. The sixth has to do with addressing misconceptions and perceived justifications of abuse and domestic violence um, through the Quran and the Sunnah. And then the seventh is how to address and to respond to domestic violence when it does occur. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you very much for this very important work that, we're, that you're doing. We, uh, we wish you well. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for watching. If you like what we do, please share, like, and subscribe. Stay safe and God bless.